Welcome, welcome anyone who's joining us for today's live stream. Uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. Um, let folks join in um, and start talking about LLMs uh, and how you can start integrating them in with your hardware projects, adding smart capabilities to your smart machines. Uh, we'll get going in just a minute. Thanks for coming today. So thanks for your patience as we're about to get started. Alrighty, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to Live Laugh LLM. Uh, and we're going to take teaching all about LLMs, a little bit of learning about them in general, and a little bit about uh, how you can start using them into your projects um, for VM and beyond, uh, and what might come next. Um, so for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Nick Hare. I'm a senior dev advocate at VM, and uh, I am very big into home automation. I've been exploring and, and learning more about embedded engineering uh, over the years and really just trying to make my devices smarter um, without you know, compromising on privacy or security and, and those types of things. Um, and you can find me online on Twitter, Mastodon, GitHub, everywhere uh, as Hipster Brown. So what is an LLM? I'm sure we've all been hearing about them in the news over the past few years. Um, we've heard the term and it you know, maybe gets a little bit convoluted um, on the news and uh, everywhere else, but what exactly is a LLM? So a large language model extends from a branch of artificial intelligence and natural language processing in order to you know, work on languages, on text. Um, that is primarily the training data used to create this machine learning model architecture uh, based on what's known as transformers. Uh, and it's the LLM responsibility to encode text, typically given as what we call a prompt, um, and to find relationships from that text and create what might match as like the correct or what it might believe as the proper response. And so finding those relationships and pattern matching that is really what makes an LLM tick uh, at the end of the day. Um, it does a lot of advanced things in order to do that um, and how it breaks up the text and how it describes those relationships, how it's trained and tuned over time. Um, some folks in the industry, and I've heard this uh, described as being what's called a stochastic parrot, um, meaning that it's very much repeating the words and text and knowledge that it hears um, without fully comprehending and understanding it um, because it doesn't understand things. Uh, it is really, again, doing that pattern matching to echo out what it thinks you might want to hear as the end user. Um, I often think of them as word calculators as well in the same way. Um, you put words in, you get words out, and maybe some other things sometimes. Uh, and the LLMs, these models, understand text and word just as about as much as a calculator by understanding numbers. Um, it's just part of the calculation that it's doing, um, part of its computation. So what types of LLMs are out there? Like large language model is a descriptor of kind of a few different types of things. Um, and so there are a lot out there, but to give a high level overview, we have foundation models, we have instruct models, and we also have chat and task models. So for foundation models, this is the base. This is our GPTs, our llamas, our Gemini slash Gemma, uh, Mistral, Mixtral, Claude, these types of 
foundation models are built on general knowledge. Uh, it's that training data and not much else on top of it. And, you know, it's trying to be everything for all people, very versatile, which is great for, you know, if you're not sure what you need out of it, you can start, you know, prompting it and getting something back out of it very broad. Um, but in order to maybe find more repeatable or accurate responses, uh, you're going to have a harder time with a foundation model versus some of the things built on top of it. Um, so some of those things are instruct models, which, as the name suggests, uh, follow instructions. They're very task-oriented, focused on trying to follow those commands that you give it, uh, rather than you know maybe being conversational, uh, which we'll find out. And you'll find a lot of these base models may have a dash instruct um, tuned variant of the base model. So it's going to have additional training data and learning built on top of it in order to be you know rewarded for following tasks correctly and more accurately. It's still kind of broad in some ways in that it's like you can do it, give it a lot of different tasks to try and do, and it'll do its best to follow it accurately. And then we have chat models, which are something that we're probably more and more familiar with these days because of the you know, openness of things like ChatGPT and Bard, now Gemini, or a bunch of these user interfaces that we're seeing for talking to these models. Um, they're tuned to be engaging and conversational. They have a lot of dialogue in their training data in order to recreate what it would be to sound more human, to sound more like you are going to talk to someone else or you're kind of sharing ideas and trying to get feedback on them. And then just like with Instruct, you might find a dash chat sort of tuned variant of these base models um, as you're you know, searching things like Kaggle or Hugging Face. And of course, we also have things like task models, which are going to be sort of subject matter experts. And these models are going to be almost further tuned versions of our instruct models. And they're going to be subject dependent in a lot of ways, more narrow, a bit more performant because of that, and will be better in the areas that it's further trained. Um, we've seen things like GitHub Copilot for programming feedback, for suggestions, um, translations, having just a large model focused on translating to many different languages, not necessarily giving you feedback on the content of it, but allowing you to make accurate, maybe more colloquial translations. Um, medical and legal knowledge being the basis for um, giving feedback on what you're asking about. If you need to know a lot about a corpus of medical or legal knowledge, which there's a lot out there, can be helpful to have a specifically tuned task model to provide analysis and and um, again, that feedback. So other parts of an LLM that you may learn about or see pop up uh, when trying to decide on what type to use or what type to explore, um, you'll hear about parameters. Um, and these values that are stored and tuned uh, during the training process uh, can greatly increase accuracy, but also require more computation in order to run the models at the end of the day. Um, so these parameters will store kind of the complex relationships um, between the training data and how the words and the text in that training data are related to other parts of the training data and be able to make those connections, those neurons of sorts. Um, and further tuning that during the training will allow for more accurate responses, as I said. And then you'll see these ranges of parameters uh, go from several hundred million to a billion. You'll see that like 1B uh, in order to say that's the, how many parameters are built into this model up to 7 to 13 billion. Uh, the Llama 7B is a very popular variant um, up to 70 billion and more. And so some of these larger mixed role, again, Llama 2, Gemini, they have billions upon billions of parameters that they can use to, you know, describe relationships, describe their corpus of knowledge that they're trained on.
And you also hear about context windows. Uh, this is the top of the mind memory. Uh, the It's going to influence, there is prompt responsing. It can be included in all sorts of ways as part of, you know, all right, here's a whole bunch of text I want to include in my prompt and then ask something about it. Um, this can lead to greater relevance, but also the more context you have to process in order to then get back the response, the longer it's going to take unless you have, you know, again, more and more computation behind it. Uh, this is usually defined in tokens, and a word could be one or more tokens, depending on how the model is defined and the encoding and the decoding of words and text as tokens. And those, again, can range from hundreds of tokens as part of a context window up to millions. And we're starting to see millions from the newer and newer models, usually tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in order to, you'll see them described as like, oh, you could put the context of Moby Dick into a context window and then start asking questions about it, which can provide, you know, immediate relevance about that text in particular, rather than just being trained on a book like Moby Dick and then trying to find that connection back to it as part of the training data, which is all basically muddled together into the long-term memory of something like a large language model. So how do you go about using these things? Uh, we know a bit more about them. And you know, there's a variety of ways you can get started with an LLM. You have you know, the UIs. You have a API of sorts from an HTTP sort of REST-based API. Um, that may be more programmatic for you to to work with. Um, there's direct inferencing, or you know, almost passing your prompts and everything directly to the model itself, rather than over uh, a remote API uh, over a network. Um, and then you have the hosted and local ways of communicating and working with these models. Um, the UIs, again, are something we're probably all more familiar with these days. Uh, you will get a prompt sort of text input. You'll have this conversation built up over the, the UI uh, and be able to see that response, that generation, um, as it provides feedback through your conversation as you're talking with it, as you're you know giving it some follow-up questions and to scroll back and see that. And, more and more of them are allowing for more and more sort of inputs as well as for images and, and audio. And we'll talk a bit more about that. This is great for getting to know what a model can do or getting to know what LLMs in general can do and what sort of feedback they might give us, uh, and what sort of like shaping you can do with your prompts. Um, it's very quick to have this nice iteration um, feedback loop. But to build it into your applications, you might reach for something like a HTTP API or um, some type of software development kit or SDK provided by the services themselves. So OpenAI for ChatGPT and their other models has a Python SDK, among others, that can be used to get completions. Um, and in this case, completion is saying, you know, Here's an instruction, so I can write a short poem about a, a robot who falls in love with the moon. And then getting that completion back from, in this case, the model being uh, the text Da Vinci model. And this allows you know, to build it into the rest of your program logic, to the rest of your, um, you know, what you're trying to do, whether it's a web service or a CLI or, or whatever it might be. Uh, or you can use and sort of communicate with the model directly. Um, this is great for, you know, building it into things like devices, which we'll just about to go into, uh, or hosting it yourself and be able to use your own hardware, um, have more control. And uh, Llama.cpp is a, a very popular way of inferencing, uh, which is basically as you inference with machine learning models, the same goes with LLMs, insert, infer the response back from some sort of input. Um, and the Llama CPP uh, package has a bunch of bindings to various languages, including Python. And so you can pull in the Llama-CPP-Python library in order to communicate with it. So you can create you know, a Llama instance pointing to a model on your file system 
uh, giving it the sort of like chat feedback. And in this way, you tend to have, again, a bit more control because now you know where the model exists. You can do a lot more of the, uh, I won't call it fine tuning because uh, it has a whole nother meaning, but rather provides a way to tweak a bit of what the response might look like um, using what might be described as temperature or penalties for repeating uh, certain words or repeating words at all um, and being able to affect that outcome at a bit more minor levels. And so you can see ways of providing this context through messages in, for example, this um, Llama CPP program of saying, okay, a system being like the assistant itself, the, the LLM, their role in this, uh, and then your role um, as a user of the LLM being able to pass in that prompt. Um, and we'll go a bit over some of the chat formats um, as we go into you know, using these, these modules directly. And so as I described before a little bit, like we have hosted um, LLMs, which can provide a lot more powerful models because um, on these big company infrastructures, these data centers somewhere running powerful GPUs, multiple GPUs sometimes to run some of those really big 70 billion parameter plus um, models that can you know take a lot of resources, but provide a lot more accuracy um, and a, you know, a lot more performance at the same time. Uh, they're generally paid products because, you know, they're running infrastructure and uh, they're providing this as a product for you to use. Uh, it's network dependent because you have to make those requests out to those data centers, to those places where these things are hosted. Um, and, you know, you read through your privacy restrictions with those. You pass your data in in some way if you want to use those processes, um, use those products. And that's up to you. Like, it's... I can't promise everything will be private because it depends on what services you're using. So it's like, it'll vary from place to place. And then you have the local versions of these things. So you can host models on your computer, on a local server, um, on various devices, uh, depending on the size of them and the hardware that you have. Um, and they can, you know, they're usually, they're going to be open source models because they're available for the public and for people to go use and with certain restrictions, depending on the model itself, in terms of commercial viability and everything. Um, and the quality can vary greatly because people are all constantly remixing them and, and creating new ones and tuning other ones for different use cases. It's up to you to kind of suss out what's good for your use. Um, it's free um, because you can use it on your own hardware but then if you have to host it yourself you know nothing in life is free right it's something going to cost something whether it's your time or the electricity you're running um, or your network bandwidth um, in order to run these things yourselves but that's again something more that you can control how much you use it uh, and it's your data uh, you can own it you can pass your data in you can you know direct how much data is being used by these things and how much it cares about it um, and you know exactly what you're passing in and what it's being used for uh, because you are again in control of that um, and the local versions of these things can be uh, a mix of hosting an api through something like olama um, or using something like uh, the local ai sort of desktop applications or uh, another, a newer one called jan um, or again running something like llama cpp locally or some of these other um, PyTorch, Transformers, those sort of libraries uh, directly against those models. Um, so you have the choice there of like how you'd want to work against those. Uh, so this is why you all might be here. Uh, how do you integrate LLMs with Veeam? Uh, so you have a few choices and as a lot of these uh, live streams have gone, it's all about modules. So uh, VM itself does not have a built-in capability to you know, talk to an LLM, host them, things like that. Instead, it's part of our registry of modules. Uh, if you haven't checked out the registry yet, here's a bunch of good examples to take a look at. So we have a chat GPT module from someone on our team uh, that you know, uses that OpenAI uh, SDK, and you can pass in your OpenAI API key and talk to GPT 3.5 Turbo um, and start to have a sort of conversation and start to build in programmatic controls that way. 
Or uh, you can use the local LLM module that I authored uh, that uses that Llama CP Python package and handles the downloading of models that you, you can find on Hugging Face. Um, it defaults to one called Tiny Llama. That's a 1.1 billion parameter um, version of the Llama architecture. I'm not going to go into those different architectures too much right now. You can you know do that research, but uh, this allows you to again run those models on a device directly, um, or you could use sort of a uh, super module. Um, the speech module itself uh, provides not only access to getting completions from OpenAI, OpenAI uh, to you know chat with. Um, GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, um, but also provides speech to text, text to speech capabilities to kind of combine it together into a sort of assistant interface. Um, so if you wanted to create your own sort of prototype version of a smart assistant, um, I won't say any out loud in case they're going to trigger, um, but that will help you get started with that and start to prototype to see what's possible with your own hardware today um, using some of these modules to get started. Uh, let's take a look at those modules directly. So I have set up a uh, Live Laugh LLM uh, test device, test machine. Um, and I have a couple parts actually because I wanted to demonstrate a little bit of the different performances you might see from running a local OLM. And I'm going to be focusing on the local OLM um, because it's newer for most people of how to how they would run them on device directly. Um, and so we have this main one, which is actually running on a Raspberry Pi 5, I think 8 gigabyte um, on my desk right here. And I also have it running on my Mac that I'm streaming from at the moment. Um, hopefully that it doesn't impact the stream too much. We'll see. So I have pulled in and deployed the local LLM, local LLM um, module from VM Labs, and we can see that here. Um, it's in the registry. There's some instructions for how to go and pull it in, um, and all the various configurations that's available for uh, this module itself. Uh, including affecting that system message that we were looking at before, um, describing the where to get the model from when it's first starting up, um, which can take time because it's downloading megabytes, maybe gigabytes uh, at first, and then it will cache it between startup and between module updates. Um, something like that temperature I was talking about before, which can affect the randomness of these modules, the creativity, the hallucinations that may come up. Um, and so it'll default to one that's like leaning towards the more, I don't know, more consistent one um, and uh, tends to, and then you could lower the temperature um, for, again, more robotic responses in terms of more stoic, maybe not as creative. Um, and the NGPU layers is really only concern if you're going to run it on a GPU for running it on something like a Pi 5 right now, it's the default is fine because it's going to be only CPU. For running on my Mac, it's actually going to be uh, more optimal for me to run it um, with uh, one GPU later because it'll run on an optimized version of what's on the GPUs on Mac Silicon called Metal APIs. Um, and so we'll go over how to configure that out um, as we test them out. So we can see here, I have the local LM module here. Um, I have it under my services. I've set the temperature to one, so we can kind of see what that looks like. Um, and uh, it's just called LLM service. If we go into the Mac configuration, I don't have anything set up right now, so it's using all the defaults. So let's actually set that N uh, GPU layers to one. Um, and this setting comes from the Llama CPP Python package of like with a recommendation for what to do there. So I'm going to save that config um, and we can see it's going to go through um, and just reconfigure the module real quick um, to use that new setting. And I go to my terminal. I already have um, two uh, 
uh, client examples for the Python SDK uh, in uh, VM. And uh, this is coming from, this is found in the local um, module GitHub repo. Um, and so you can learn how to start testing that on your own. Uh, so I'm going to run Python. Let's start with the one on my Pi 5, which is just the uh, regular client.py. Um, and the way I've configured this script is to prompt me here. So it's a regular chat interface rather than hard coding it into the uh, Python script itself. And uh, let's see. Let's say, uh, tell me a story about two robots on an adventure. So that's going to make a request through the chat API that I've created to talk to um, the local OM module running on the Pi 5. We'll see how that comes back uh, with anything. And there's ways, again, to maybe make this a bit more performant depending on your use case if you want to shorten how long certain responses can be, which will make it respond faster because it's going to not spend as much time generating tokens. Um, there's ways to tell it to be succinct by putting that in the system prompt itself. Um, by Even for the initial prompt context self, I could just say, like, tell me a story and no more than 200 words or 50 words um, just to make sure it responds quickly. Um, we'll see how long this takes as I'm chatting. Um, and something that I described before was the chat format. Um, so this is going to use the default chat format for the tiny llama. Um, and that format is, think of it as a template for the uh, model to know what is a system message versus what is a um, what is a user message in the way that it's going to send the prompt over um, as a whole context window to the LLM. So we can see here, um, I asked to tell me a story. It says, sure, two friendly robot friends named Rex and Luda decided to embark on an epic adventure together. Rex has been programmed, uh, had been programmed to be a brave leader while Luna uh, was responsible for taking care of the little robot pet Waffles. Wow, included a little, ro little a robot pet without him even asking. It's just this set started with. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but you can see it came back with quite a rich text there. Um, and it took some time because it, it generated so much text to come back from it. Um, now let's try out my um, the one on my Mac. And we can actually see here through the timing, I believe, uh, when I first sent the request. Um, Potentially. So we started around, took a you know, a little under a minute or so, a uh, minute and a half to, to generate all of that. Um, so let's try out the examples client Mac. We'll try the same prompt. Tell me a story about two robots. Um, let's be very specific. Uh, on an adventure. We'll see how long this takes to generate. Um, and again, it's kind of funny because it's going to be talking directly to VM server running on my machine. Wow, that was quick. Um, and again, it's because it's running a GPU optimized um, inferencing, uh, as well as running a very tiny model. Uh, 1.1 billion parameters isn't that big in the, the grand scheme of models where you could honestly run on a device like a MacBook Air even, or something with a little bit more RAM, uh, run like a 7 billion parameter model rather than 1.1 billion parameter. Um, some of the beefier MacBooks or things with a GPU, uh, like a gaming GPU, you could run like a 13 billion parameter one uh, with decent performance. But in this case, you saw it was fairly quick to respond back with something. And um, this was telling me a completely different story about a robot named Toto and his best friend Tom. Um, and we, can see that variation, that you know, creativeness, um, so to speak, for these LLMs that come back for, even from me passing the same prompt. Maybe it was that temperature that tuned it a little bit. Maybe it's just the built-in randomness. Like I bet if I, given that this is so fast, um, let's ask it again and see what happens. Um, tell me a story about two robots on. 
Now, this just doesn't need to be a storytelling robot or a short storytelling, you know, LLM or what I'm building here. But this is just an example of what sort of sort of context and, and sort of prompts we can pass back to it. And we got a whole different answer back now with that same prompt um, and, you know, maybe much more rich stories, definitely longer. Um, and if let's kind of play around with what sort of things could we find out about it? Because the amount of the parameter size, as I said before, kind of affects its accuracy, but as well as its knowledge base that it's built into that long-term memory. Um, so if I were to ask about um, how many people live in New York City, we can see, again, very quick, um, now it says 8.5 million people live in New York City according to the most recent census data. I can ask, uh, let's run that again. Uh, let's say, what year is it? So it thinks it's 2019 because that's the training data it was built off of. Um, whether it's synthetic or real, this is what it thinks the year is. So who knows? You know if that data is accurate uh, we can go in ways to circumvent this limitation of lms this long-term memory uh, that it has um, through some various other ways of various other architectures um, so again this is uh, one way of running an llm um, for your use in integrating with vm whether it's again local running on device or uh, running um, in a hosted data center somewhere. Uh, let's check back to our presentation. And so that was our demo. If you want to see a bit more of a, let's call it practical use case, uh, I wrote an article with um, in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Matt Vela uh, on integrating a local OLM um, and some additional machine learning visions, like one of our vision services uh, and a um, open plant recognition um, model to talk about plant care and create something that was pseudo task fo focused um, where, you know, all the prompts were going to be related to the image of the um that was recognized or the plant that was recognized by the uh uh plant recognition model itself and regular machine learning model uh and then take in and affect the context that you're passing through in a question to say uh how law often should i water this plant um and it can you know take in that that ask that that question and and you know pass it through and say oh it's a snake plant Let's see um, what, how long that takes for the, yeah, how often you should water it or how often should you care for it. Um, and so uh, that's talking about text. So you can read a bit more about that one on, our, on the VM blog. Um, what about beyond text? So we're hearing a bit more about multimodal, um, multimodal models, uh, which is a mouthful itself, multimodal LLMs. And multimodal in this case means more than just text or more than one type of input as prompt. And so um, you have vision LLM model, vision visual LLMs, VLLMs, um, that can take in both uh, images as well as text as context. So in the case I was showing up for the plant care, you know, maybe there's a model that can recognize plants already without having to use an additional like custom trained ML, um, ML model. Uh, and you could pass in the image of the plant along with a question and it would just build that without having to put in the name of plants at all. It would just recognize it and build that part of its context. Now these models are um, becoming, um, you know, more and more open source, more and more tuned, um, and also coming small enough to run on local devices more efficiently, uh, even on the CPU, in order to you know provide a more interactive experience to give more context of the world around these devices and these models um, into the the knowledge base. And so, um, again, colleague Matt Bella 
wrote uh, and uh, demonstrated how to use a VLLM called Uform um, and make it into a vision service in VM. So rather than having to even use a different um, sort of API, you can use the regular vision service API in order to classify images that you're passing through or getting directly from a camera, which I think is very neat. Um, you'll have maybe some, it won't be as accurate as, again as these large hosted models, but it's something to start out with, especially as you're figuring out what you need to recognize or as you're starting to prototype dif different ideas. Um, and so that's really interesting to see what's to come, including you know what could be coming from uh, models that can take in audio and video and all these other sort of modes of input uh, in order to affect the response coming out of it and how efficiently can we run them. Um, seeing them run on you know our 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 cell phones, our smartphones, and our laptops and watches and everything, you see some of these things like the uh, Rabbit R1 or the Humane AI pin that are, again, also taking in multimodal input in order to provide output in something that just sits in our hands. And yeah, they're probably using a hosted service in order to run those efficiently. Um, but, you know, these things are progressing so fast. How efficiently can we make them to run on smaller and smaller devices? Um, and so now we'll go into um, some questions um, from you all, the audience, um, and let's uh, check that out. So thank you, Ariel, on the back end for um, providing me the chat. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to bring up a couple questions here. Uh, so we have a question about uh, what is the reason for the variation of storylines. So that was, um, again, the randomness built into these models by default and providing the, uh, even with the same exact prompt, unless you have some sort of architecture built up where it will cache responses or, uh, and you want it to do that, um, the same exact prompt could lead to different, just in like the way we remember things kind of differently or come up with things when we get new questions um, then we might have different responses depending on when you ask them. Um, and that temperature as well can also affect it. So the temperature I had was using the default, whether it was like 1.0 or 0.25 or 75, um, that's going to make it be a bit more creative. Um, if you were to go, I mean, it's it playing around with the temperature is something fun to do because you can, um, if you go beyond 1.0, uh, it can get really funky. Uh, may even return like non-understandable, you know, text, um, or start using different languages when you ask for maybe you know your your home language. Um, and if you go down to again, it will be less creative if you go down to like 0 0.2. If I went to like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it might return that same thing all the time. And it may not even be something that I want. Um, it may even be something like, oh, I am just a machine. I can't tell a story. Uh, and that's not as fun or not, not something we want out of it. Um, so that can really affect uh, what we're seeing from the responses in uh, the models themselves. Uh, so how much did it cost for running sample inferences via VM modules? Uh, so if we're talking about the local LLM itself, um, there was no cost as far as I can tell. Um, because I hosted them on my devices and I'm just using the API to talk to them. Um, I'm not storing any data on VM. I'm also not using a hosted service um, from in the cloud somewhere. It's directly talking to, again, I, it's free in that like, I know I'm paying for electricity and everything like that and like my network bandwidth for my home internet. But uh, for as far as like paying for stuff through for VM or some other service, um, we're just, the data is on our device. You're talking to it. It's you know free to use. Um, I can verify and, and back up that claim a little bit later if you ask me again in Discord there, uh, Professor D. Um, so that is one of those nice levers you can use. Um, and something I didn't necessarily show off or demonstrate is you saw how more powerful it was to run on my laptop versus um, the Raspberry Pi. Now, the Raspberry Pi was pretty good depending on you know showing off how much is coming back and the fact that this is a you know LLM running on an embedded device um, that's pretty incredible and having that on the field uh, again combined with some speech to text text to speech or any other sort of um, input from the world 
can create some pretty interesting outcomes um, in terms of providing you know structure back or working with a like human computer interface. Um, and you could use a uh, sort of what we kind of do a multi-part architecture is what we try to refer to it at VM. Uh, that multi-part architecture um, allows for, you know, you can, as you saw, I had multiple machines in my uh, VM configuration and uh, those multiple machines can communicate with each other in the same um, program. So you can have direct communication between like the Pi with all the hardware capabilities that it has in terms of um, servo controls or taking an audio input. Um, I could take in that as a sort of satellite and then send the text that it translates or the text that comes in from speech and send it off to a more powerful device like um, let's say a Mac mini somewhere, um, even on the same network or part of the same machine itself in order to do the larger computation more quickly. So you don't even have to like opt into a, again, hosted service if you were um, wanting to have quicker inferencing um, or more powerful models to run. Instead, you could break it up a little bit and to say, okay, well, this part is responsible for these controls um, or they're interacting with the real world. And then I will pass off the responsibility for, um, the computation, the heavy computation um, to another device, whether that's a, you know, Jetson Nano or something that might run these LLMs very, very efficiently because it's running, you know, NVIDIA CUDA cores um, and be able to do a lot of stuff in parallel. Um, so that's another interesting architecture depending on you know, your budget and what you have available for power, um, but totally possible. Uh, I got a question about the favorite LLM project I've worked on with VM um, and what's one that I would want to work on. Um, so that plant project was actually pretty fun because you're trying to find some interesting ways to use an LLM without resorting to just chat. Um, now we are chatting with it in a way, but be able to, again, scope it to helping us take in human language and translate out that um, and give it a more human response. Um, so rather than having a rote response for every single question or any sort of like input, we can have something, again, more conversational, um, more creative, um, but also have a knowledge base that backs it. And so um, that was a lot of fun to work on and see that outcome work out fairly well. Um, one that I would want to work on is actually trying to, uh, the phrase is ground, but more like base the feedback from the LLMs in you know, real data from the, the devices. So not just images, but what about sensor data that we have? Um, so if we're taking in sensor data around the like accelerometer, if it's like a VM Rover, maybe uh, like what if, or something like Tipsy uh, that we have as a, a project on our, our tutorials and something that the team has worked on um, where Tipsy goes around asking or like trying to offer drinks. Um, that's Tipsy like one. Um, but what if we could add on a local LLM onto Tipsy in order to suggest drinks, uh, depending on, and you could ground that in, or saying, um, be able to provide feedback about what it's interacting with. What if it could say, like, it could see that it was stuck based on the sensor data, and then, you know, say that out loud, provide some helpful feedback um, in the real world, um, and be able to just kind of compose that capability onto the existing Tipsy rather than trying to re-architect from scratch. Um, is really nice. I'd be able to kind of break it up or even like add it on over time. Um, it doesn't have to be there from the beginning. We don't have to ship a you know big code base with it. Instead, we can break it up again into these modules into this modular architecture. Um, and so I think it'd be really fun to either you know make Tipsy smarter about like what if a Tipsy was like the suggested bartender and we could give it a knowledge base of like the drinks that were available and say okay these are the drinks that we have and you know talking to one of the, as it's going around and roaming, provide suggestions or when you run out, how do you let it know that over time? And so demonstrating how you can ground these um, and, and make sure that it has sources to look at. This is something called uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG, if you're looking it up later, um, that allows it to use a live knowledge base. Again, affecting that like frozen time memory and giving it more of a short term memory to, to feed from and that you can keep up to date more quickly. Um, so you could create a, you know, database 
um, or knowledge base of, you know, the available drinks, you know, how long is the party going to last and those sort of things um, that you can, um, you know, make our machines smarter um, and make them easier to use by more people as well. Um, I think that's really interesting to keep exploring that area. Uh, can you make a LLM learn from conversation as it happens? I'm thinking about the projects that you mentioned with knowledge base and wondering if the project learn preferences based on the tipsy bartender idea. Um, sort of. Uh, because of that sort of retrieval augmented generation, that RAG workflow, you can kind of do that. Now, RAG does take processing to happen. It can be a, um, it's not immediate. Um, unless you were to take all of the things that it learned or listened to or, or discovered that night and to keep it all in that top of mind memory, that context window, which is, again, very limited relative to these larger models when running on devices. Um, and uh, the uh, you could stuff it in there, but then it's going to have a limitation. And then once that's overfilled, uh, it can have some really weird effects to the responses. Um, for a RAG, uh, when you have, you have to have a database um, that you can, you have to generate what are called embeddings. Um, and these embeddings are vector data structures, um, basically arrays of numbers in, in various forms, uh, and that are the encodings of this text. It's basically like a little bit of what the, these parameters are stored as as well. It's it's a little bit different, but I won't get into too much of the nuance. Um, so it takes some computation to create those embeddings. So if you just say like, you know, Tipsy learns everyone's names throughout the night um, and stores that as embedding, it has to do that you know, kind of in the background um, and then kind of keep pulling from it. It could happen. It would just take some, um, again, processing power and making sure that um, it's not doing too much at once. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be immediate. But yeah, you could learn over time, but without affecting the long-term memory of the model itself. Um, so like fine-tuning can affect long-term memory versus RAG can do short-term memory. And that um, called context window can be like top of mind. Um, it's like, I just learned that. It's going to always be what I'm thinking about as I'm giving a response. Um, yeah, and if anyone has any more questions, I... I I've been really enjoying learning about this subject um, over past few months, really, as we started to like, explore, okay, can you run a LLM on the device? Um, and which devices and what are the limitations of this? Um, there are more and more of these powerful um, devices coming out there uh, that can help out a lot. Um, you can even run VM server on a traditional like hosted cloud server um, and that's backed by a GPU if you want to kind of go with that architecture too. That multi-part can go and span, you know, full like data center to device um, still using that secure VM connection. Um, and it's, uh, there's just a whole open world of that. Even when doing research for this stream, there's all these new models talking about, you know, analyzing time series data, translations, um, and, uh, you can really dive into the rabbit hole with that, um, into like how optimized can you make it? Um, and I've never even done things like fully fine tuning a model. I've only taken models off the shelf. And so that's something interesting to explore, um, over time and using and training them myself, um, again, based off of some specific data set and gathering data over time. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to find out. Uh, and if you have any other questions about this sort of stuff, you can join us in our Discord. Um, the Community AI, AI Challenge is still happening, so you can still enter your ideas if you want to be able to use the local LLM module or that speech module or anything like that. Um, we're happy to help you out. I have some office hours um, the rest of this week and next week um, that you should be able to find in the Discord as well. If you want to kind of sit down one-on-one -on -one and maybe iterate through something or if you're running to an issue, reach out. I'm happy to help out. Um, I'm very excited about what you all can build uh, with these capabilities. I think it'll be um, a lot of fun to see how you all progress. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, I appreciate everyone who joined today. 
Um, and I hope you all um, have a great rest of your day and uh, week. Um, and, you know, happy hacking. Uh, looking forward to see you all online and maybe in a future stream. Thanks so much.